Hello and welcome to the Arbitration Conversation. So this week we're going to be talking to Professor Sarah Rudolph Cole. Now, Sarah Rudolph Cole is the Michael E. Moritz Chair in Alternative Dispute Resolution at the Ohio State University Moritz College of Law. She's also the, the director of their program on dispute resolution. She's been teaching and writing about arbitration law and also has been a practitioner as an arbitrator in the field in employment and commercial matters and labor matters. So I'm super excited to have her here. I've been reading her articles and following her research forever. And so this time I get to talk to her about her new article that's coming out, Arbitration Diversity, colon, Can It Be Achieved? So Sarah, thanks for coming. Well, thank you, Amy. And you know, I've been following your work very closely for many years. So it's a pleasure to have an opportunity to talk to you professionally as we often do, but uh, this will be a great experience. So I first want to, and, and when the article, I can't wait till it's in everybody's hands, but you start out the article with a story about Jay-Z and arbitration. If you wouldn't mind sharing that with the viewers. It is, it's so rare, as you know, Amy, to have a really interesting hook for an arbitration article, um, since it's a sort of seemingly to many people kind of an esoteric or boring topic. But what happened was Jay-Z in his sort of commercial capacity um, makes clothing. Um, and I think the company he owns is called Rockaware. Uh, and he had a disagreement, he and his company had a disagreement with another corporation. And in, in, of course, like with many corporations, they had an arbitration clause. So he ended up talking, uh, they, they were assigned an arbitrator who I, I believe had no sort of diverse characteristics. And he objected um, because none of the arbitrators on the list they were given, and typically you get a list of 10 or 15 names, um, were black. And he said this violated his constitutional rights um, and that he is entitled uh, under equal protection to have uh, a diverse selection of arbitrators from which he could choose an ultimate arbitrator. And while I say in the article, I'm not sure that the constitutional arguments would probably fly because arbitration is a, a private process. That point became very interesting to the media. And I had spoken to a couple different media outlets about it and thought, I, I thought for a long time about this issue of the lack of diversity among arbitrators who are selected to hear cases. And so I thought I'd explore a little bit more about that. Well, I especially like the question, can it be achieved? Because as you write in the article and distill the different groups like the AAA and JAMS and CPR, they've come forth with different pronouncements or pledge, a diversity pledge or different statements. So do you think that they've been very effective? Have these statements really produced change or brought about better diversity in arbitration? Amy, that, that's a great question because I think there's sort of the two parts. I think AAA and JAMS and CPR all care very much about diversifying their arbitrator core and their diversity pledges or AAA's Higginbotham Fellows where they bring in people with diverse backgrounds and provide them really amazing training and mentoring opportunities that they could get nowhere else. Um, and CPR has diversity statements and a pledge that corporations can take that they promise that they will choose arbitrators who um, have diverse characteristics. But then it's the problem of how arbitrators are selected. Uh, you know, that you not only have to get diverse arbitrators on your roster, which we can talk about in a second about the challenge of getting um, women and minorities onto rosters, but then to convince the lawyers who are typically the ones selecting the arbitrators to choose this arbitrator who they don't know very well and give them the power to adjudicate a major issue for their clients is a very challenging thing. Although there are some, I have some thoughts about why maybe it's less challenged and challenging than people think it is. But ultimately, I think that all of these institutions are very committed to diversity. I have no doubt they'll continue being more committed given what everything that's happening in the world. And AAA has moved its numbers about 5% in terms of between 2012 and now, they went from 22% diversity uh, arbitrators selected to like 27%. So they, they've shown an increase, but if you think about 27%, that means you know over 70% of the arbitrators are still the kind of classic older white male who has historically been an arbitrator. Well, and let's go back to, in, in, as you mentioned in the article and kind of going back to something you said a minute ago, um, what about that argument? Well, gosh, it's the client's fault. The clients are the ones who select, contract, 
rules and arbitration is a matter of contract. So that's really what the problem is. It's the clients. Is that an acceptable argument? Yeah, well, I think it is an argument. And I think it's like a combination of client and outside counsel. You know, who is making the ultimate decision? My suspicion would be that the lawyers kind of talk with the client about who they know on the on the panel on the roster that's sent to the parties. And they probably consult with other uh, people within the firm and they use their connections to find out whatever information they can find out about an arbitrator. And often those are going to be arbitrators who've been used before. Um, I worked at a law firm in Chicago before I went into teaching. And after every labor arbitration we were involved in, we were supposed to go down and write uh, our sort of assessment of how the arbitrator ran, ran the hearing. And every time um, an arbitrator a roster came by, we would use that as a resource to try and figure out who did we think the good arbitrators would be. Um, and so on that, if, if you use that mechanism, it's pretty hard to pick the new ones. And I do think CPR and AAA are on to something with these pledges, because I think what you need is really a pre-commitment strategy by, these, by, the, by the clients and by the lawyers to say, we believe before we have a dispute that it's very important to have at least a diverse group from which we are going to select an arbitrator. Um, and there's even sort of further pre-commitment they could make, but at least minimally, we want to see a diverse roster of names. Um, we want to choose diverse arbitrators and, and have them sign some sort of pledge. And I think CPR just recently for its three-person panel said that, they, that, that parties can pre-commit to have at least one person on that three-person panel be a woman or a minority in the hopes that be more likely to be be selected. Yeah, I love that's such a great point. Um, you when you were talking about your Chicago experience, I was thinking about when I was in practice um, doing construction law, and we did a lot of arbitration, and it was the same. You know, it was always white male individuals who had been selected before, so we already had intel on these individuals, and so then we kept selecting the same people. So it's almost like a pipeline issue to some extent. Yeah, and I do think pipeline is a big concern. And one of the things Michael Green has written about this topic quite a bit too. And he was he wants to use a model that the sort of the federal judiciary has, which is you try to increase the numbers of diverse people who are federal judges, and then they're randomly assigned to cases. And maybe we could get pre-commitments from parties to randomly assign arbitrators to cases. And in fact, AAA, and I write about this in the article, sort of did that with its consumer disputes. Um, instead of the parties selecting the arbitrator, basically AAA assigns an arbitrator from their national roster. So the person is qualified to hear the case, um, but the parties kind of have given up if they want to use the consumer arbitration rules, uh, given that power to AAA. And I, I suggest in the article that employment discrimination would be another area in which they might consider that kind of roster assignment process, which obviously would result in more selection. I mean, it really wouldn't be selection at that point, it'd be assignment of a diverse arbitrator and get people more experience. And it, to me, it makes more sense in employment discrimination cases, which tend to be a little lower value, but also tend to involve typically more diverse litigants. Um, so that the, there would be a lot of pluses. Um, and that leads me to another point. People always say, well, I don't want to pick an arbitrator who I don't know, but maybe you do because you can't be, you know, the client isn't going to look at you and say, well, you picked that person, you said they'd be fair, and look, we lost. If you didn't get a choice about who the arbitrator is, maybe you could at least say, look, I, I thought you know, this would be, a, she, she or he would be a good decision maker, didn't work out that way, but it was a fair process. Because you and I both know the fact that you lose in an arbitration doesn't mean the arbitrator was unfair, or the process was unfair, it might be that you have the losing side of that case. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So I wanted to get into some more of the ideas that you had in, in your article about ways that we could maybe help promote diversity in, the, in arbitration. And you talk about information and how that might be provided. Could you maybe provide a little more, um, explain to those listening? Absolutely. So you know that there historically has been very little information available about arbitrators. Um, typically, you get pretty short bios, maybe a page long, and most of them just refer to where they went to law school, if they went to law school, or what they've written, or for who, uh, for whom they arbitrate, other than the organization that um, you you're using. So one of the things Jams did that I thought was really helpful is they put pictures 
of the arbitrators on their website. Now, that may have some um, backlash too, because if you're not looking for somebody, if you're not looking for a minority arbitrator, maybe you'd look at that and say, I don't want that person because they're not of the same race as my client. But hopefully it would instead sort of humanize um, the arbitrators. And it also allowed uh, people to provide reviews of the arbitrators. And I suspect that on the actual institutional websites, you're not gonna see much negative in terms of reviews um, of, of people, but at least it was reflection of what did clients say or what did parties say after these arbitrations about these people. And I came across as I was doing this research, something called the robing room, which wasn't, is not a heavily utilized website, but basically an independent website that provides feedback on um, how judges decide cases and, and their characteristics and how, you know, how they handled discovery. They had sort of a series of questions they asked parties who'd appeared in front of these judges to try and give future parties more perspective on what they were entering into, even though, of course, with judges, you don't get that kind of choice. And that led me to looking at sort of merit selection in, in those jurisdictions that basically retain judges as long as they meet sort of certain criteria, Iowa being one of them. And uh, boy, they have like a 10 point um, questionnaire that they send to all the lawyers who've appeared in front of these judges and they get a lot of information that they can then share um, you know, to the general public about the judges. And, 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 and then that helps those uh, people decide whether they wanna reelect the judge. Uh, but it also, from an arbitrator's perspective, would be helpful to have out there information about the arbitrator. And, and not about, did you agree with the ruling, but more, did they handle discovery in an efficient manner? Were they fair during the process? Did everybody have an opportunity to speak and those types of things? Would these reviews be anonymous? Because is there concern that it could be like a rate my professor or some oh, of these other? I don't know. Right? No. Yeah. I, no, no, so that's a really good question. I, I guess I hope that unlike, um, I should say unlike students, students are very fair typically. Rate my professor is <laughs> another, another world, but um, you know, I hope lawyers would be more even handed in the way they did reviews. I guess I doubt people would be likely to send in reviews if their names were associated with it, unless it was positive. Um, but I, I still think like maybe it'd be more of a, a rating system. And then if you had enough people rating this arbitrator, you could just provide the rating and not really talk about the qualitative comments that people may have made. And uh, you know, so that, that's, a, that's a great point though, that you have to figure out how to make that work. And some literature has suggested that women and minorities fare more fare poorly in review systems as well, because there may be some implicit biases at play in terms of their evaluation. Or people are so used to the way uh, a man uh, would run a hearing that maybe the way a woman does it, I have no idea, would be less attractive to those uh, litigants. So some inherent right. problems with that as well. That's the thing that would worry me, just because you know that happens all the time with professors. But I think um, that would be a concern. You know, if a woman was stern, how would that be viewed, right? Or not stern, but strict or tidy, <laughs> or you know, it would come across differently if it were a man versus a woman, perhaps. Um, so those are some things that would kind of worry me. But I'm sure if you can figure out a way to do it in a manner you know, especially making sure that individuals know that they, yeah, I mean, they wouldn't want to certainly, they wouldn't want to be um, providing incorrect information or something negative where they could later be, especially as a lawyer, you would, as you said, you would hope that they would be really straightforward and, and fair, but you still have to worry, right? Not everybody is straightforward and fair, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, and I do think it makes a big difference if it's a three-person panel versus a single arbitrator case because, you know, as I mentioned to you, the CPR came up with this idea of having one person of a three-person panel be uh, a, either a woman or minority and that the parties could pre-commit. And then they're just pre-committing to one out of three. But a lot of employment discrimination cases, in fact, most of the cases I've arbitrated are one-person arbitrations. And uh, so then it's much more difficult and. There, I think it might be useful to have some of this pre-commitment strategy to say, look, we want a list that has 40 to 50% of the names. Um, they're either women or minorities. And there certainly are, I think, too, um, all of these institutions have done a, a, a good job recruiting new arbitrators. But I think 
that could be ramped up, right? There are definitely at this point people with 15 years of experience in practice, um, which is the user sort of baseline for becoming an arbitrator, who are women and minorities. I mean, for the last 20 years, I think 50% of our law school class has been women. So there's no reason to think that you couldn't find qualified people to be arbitrators, um, even if that was an excuse 20, 30 years ago. But you can't just look at the major law firms' um, partnerships because we know women and minorities tend to be underrepresented in those groups because of a variety of reasons that we don't even need to get into here. But we need to be like branching out and looking in newer places. I think that's a really good idea, absolutely. And the other point about the random assignment in employment discrimination makes really good sense to me, especially because thinking about all the training one goes through to even get on the, these different rosters, right? So, I mean, if you're going to be a AAA arbitrator, it means you've already surpassed certain indications. So it seems as though a random assignment like that would make a lot of sense in those kinds of cases. Absolutely. Well, and the public, the public sector work I've done, that's what you have. But you have a panel of people who both sides, the union and management, view as acceptable. And then you're randomly assigned to cases after that. So the, one of the things I talk about in the article is whether there could be a stand-in in the plaintiff's bar for the union. And if, you know, you could have plaintiff's lawyers, plaintiff's employment discrimination lawyers agreeing that um, here's getting together somehow, maybe you could have a meeting uh, where they vet uh, arbitrators. I mean, there aren't that many in any one place, in any city or, or, or state, really the number of arbitrators who are selected for cases is actually very small. Um, so, you know, thinking about that group and then adding to it and then having the parties take, take a chance on these arbitrators, maybe for smaller value cases at first. Um, I know when I did, started with public sector, they put you on what they call a trial panel. They try you out and they see if they like you. And if they do, then you get to go to a general panel. So there could be a lot of different ways that people want to think creatively about how to improve diversity. Yeah, I mean, I think, and that's what I love about your article, is you come up with a lot of different sort of strategies and ideas. And I think the other point is we've got to do something, right, instead of just talking about it. And I think that's um, really important. Um, you know, pledges, yes, they're good. It's a nice first step. But now we want to have action. And so there's some really good action items in your article. So when will we see your article out in print? You know, that's always such a good question, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> So I know I'm doing the editing, uh, or the, edit, the article will come back from the editors in August. So probably by the end of the year, or early next year. Well, I'm excited for you and congratulations on another great article. Thank you for taking this time with us today. Really good stuff, really important stuff. So thank you very much. Thank you, Amy.